on the random. What up, y'all? Welcome to another episode of That Time in Hip Hop, a podcast about history and nostalgia in hip hop, but more importantly, the preservation of hip hop music and culture. I am your host, Vegas of Hip Hop Now Podcast. With me, as always, Happy New Year to my brother, Tony, from IntoTheDome.com. What's good, man? Hey, man. Happy New Year's uh, to you and your family, my dear. It feels like it's been a long time, man, because, you know, a little, we had a little break, you know, the holidays and things of that nature, man. But everything is good, bro. Yeah, man. I, I feel you, man. It's, I want to welcome y'all and say Happy New Year to y'all who uh, listen and watch this uh, show, whether it's on YouTube or it's on Apple Podcasts whatever the case may be, just make sure you subscribe, review the podcast, whatever you can do to support, because it shows us that you like what we do. But we kind of been doing our thing anyway, right? We got 60-something episodes. They're timeless, which is so great. Things happen in hip-hop. Me and Tone just pull out, pull something out the deck, right? Out the milk crates and say, oh, Jay Electronica dropped the album? Boom, we did a whole fucking show on what it was like waiting up until that album uh same thing for everything and man we got a powerful show for y'all today um that's dope coming from two cats who are really close to the situation in a lot of different ways as fans as as people as men so we're going to talk about all of it man uh but definitely subscribe to the podcast and most importantly share with people you know enjoy this kind of content now we like to do this thing on this show. You know, some of y'all know it's called uh, This Month in Hip Hop. And This Month in Hip Hop on January uh, 15th, 1994, Snoop Doggy Dog dropped his second single off his album, off his debut album, Doggy Style, entitled Gin and Juice. Tone, Gin and Juice, the record, when you first heard it, the video when it first came out, man, what was your thoughts, man? I was like, you know what, here we go. Because, obviously, we knew Snoop was dope. We knew he was the lead MC on The Chronic. You know, we knew about Deep Cover. We knew that, you know, he was on his way. So, when What's My Name came out, the first single, I said, you know what, it's cool. I like it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it definitely wasn't Deep mm -hmm. Cover. It wasn't nothing you know, but a G thing. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, you know, Let Me Ride. It was nothing. It, to me, it wasn't on that level, but it was a nice, you know, solo introduction to Snoop all over again, kind of without the chronic lingering over his head. But when Dan and Juice dropped, mm -hmm. then I said, okay, here we go. You know what I'm saying? Like, it banged. The video was dope and creative. It sounded good on the radio. It sounded good in the car. I said, okay, he got him one right here. This is the one that's going to help him carry you know, carry the album going into the, you know, releasing the album and it's going to be a banger in the club. It's going to be a banger, you know what I'm saying, for cookouts and from, from California all the way to where I am in North Carolina. And that's what it was. I mean, it was a massive single. You know what I'm saying? It was a massive hit. I mean, it was, that took them over the stratosphere really, you know, all over again. You know? Yeah. I, I agree, man. I, I remember the first time I heard, like, well, uh, what's my name? And I was a little disappointed. Like you said, it wasn't it wasn't bad. It was just when you're coming off a deep cover, when you're coming off the chronic, um, right. you know what I'm saying, the monster songs where Snoop really shines, you kind of felt like this was kind of low key. But I think, it, you know, it grew on me over time. But, man, when I heard Jen and Juice, I was like, this is it. Like, this is... Yeah. This is what we was waiting for. And um, I remember watching the debut of the video. You know how, like, back in the days, they used to tease it? Like, you know, coming up at 8 o'clock, Snoop mm -hmm. Dogg Dogg's debut single. I think it was, like, on BT or something where they did that. And I remember when they came on, and it was just so... It had a lot of a character, you know what I'm saying, to it. A, a lot of videos back then, sometimes they told stories. And it wasn't like this hard of the hardcore ass video, it was kind of fun, right? It kind of mirrored the, the the album cover in a lot of ways. It really did. It had yeah, character, right? Um, it was dope, man. I, I hated the clean version on the radio. I ain't even gonna front. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> it just took away from it, but. It did. 
I, I agree, man. Do you do you think gin and juice has the same energy it had back then? Like if the old school mix is on and it comes on? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> if you go to any kind of party, well, we can't party right now. Uh, we do it due to the pan pandemic, but you know that aside, you know you go to a party, old school set come on. When that DJ spin and mix in and blend in gin and juice, oh yeah, the crowd goes crazy just like it's 93, 94. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Nothing changed. It, it, see, certain legendary songs, it's a feeling. It's a movement. So it doesn't go anywhere. We parted to gin and juice in North Carolina the same way you guys would have parted to gin and juice in Brooklyn and New York, same way they mm -hmm. parted to gin and juice on the West Coast. A great song can't be denied regardless of the region, regardless of the time period or anything if you put it on right now in the club it's gonna pop off and i mean a 22 year old kid 22 year old kid gonna jump around to it same way a 45 year old man such as myself is gonna jump around to it because this is a feeling of a song that and snoop is one of the most recognizable figures in hip-hop history and in music history so mm -hmm. young people know about snoop <laughs> so gin and juice yeah. is still a popular song in, in 2021 you know decades later it pops off regardless. Yeah, I feel like it's timeless. I feel like the video is timeless too. Absolutely. It, it's like Snoop was huge at that point in time. I think, you know, I think Tone has been kind of trying to explain this to people online that, and I don't think they understand or they don't remember, but Snoop was huge when this dropped. Like, like he almost, his popularity damn near rivals his popularity today. It's just that today he does all these other things, but he was just as popular back Absolutely. then when he was gangster Snoop, you know what I'm saying? So it's um I agree, definitely um a timeless rookie in hip hop. What did y'all think? You know what I'm saying? Were you around when Snoop Doggy Dog dropped his second single, Gin and Juice, off the Doggy Style album? Leave your memories in the comment section below. We do read them. We do respond when we can. Um, and let us know what y'all think about that, man. Now, talk about timely and interconnected situations, man. We have a dope episode for y'all today, if you don't already know. And it's much deeper than you think. So, Tone, tell the people what we're here to talk about. You know what? In, in, in music, you know... Sometimes a, a splash happens, you know, like when Marvin Gaye dropped What's Going On, when Anita Baker dropped Rapture, when Prince dropped, you know, Purple Rain. You know, hip hop faced this comic a few times as well, you know, and in 1994, the hip hop world was graced with Nas dropping Illmatic. And it was heavily anticipated, you, you know. Um, People was waiting for this young guy who had dropped halftime of Zebrahead soundtrack in 1992. You had heard Back to the Grill again. You had heard Live at the Barbecue. And most hip hop aficionados and the, and, and the historians and even people our age who lived through it, they remember these times. You know, we, we know all about Illmatic mm -hmm. coming out, Five Mics. We know about, you know, P Rock, DJ Premier, LES, you know, Q Tip, you know, all these different producers you know, producing on, on the album. So we can go into that at some point. But today we want to talk about the Source magazine actually giving this album five mics. What happened as a result of this album getting five mics? What if the album would not have gotten five mics? How would you look at Illmatic? Would Illmatic be looked at as a hip-hop Bible without the ratings from the Source? Because the Source magazine at that time was everything for us in hip hop. We went every month. At one point, it was a newsletter. You know what I'm saying? Then it turned into the magazine. Mm -hmm. Then it turned into everything. It turned into I have to get there every month to read the Source. I got to go to the mic report, the, the record report to see the mics because that dictated. It, it was like psychology. It dictated mm -hmm. how you felt about the album almost before you even picked it up. You know what I'm saying? It's like, okay, it's got four and a half mics, it's got five mics. It must be dope. So you go into it with a certain energy, listen to it. And for some people that could persuade your 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 mentality towards the album, how you view it, how you rate it, and how you look at it historically. 
You know what I'm saying? So Illmatic was one of the few albums at that time that it received five months. I think before that had been a couple of years, and I think Ice Cube might have received it for America's Most Wanted. You know what I'm saying? And of course, that was a big that was a big deal because he had left the NWA, got five mics on in a New York magazine, basically East Coast magazine, rather. And he's from he's from Compton, so it was a big deal. So when Nas got it, I remember seeing the Source magazine, and I think Gangsta was on the front of that magazine. Yeah. But I'm gonna make a look, but I think Gangsta was on the front because uh, yeah, I think uh, during that time, I think Hard to Earn was coming out. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, I remember looking at that record report. I had heard a couple of songs off of it. I already knew exactly who it was, but it did make me feel like, okay, it's a classic. I got to go pick this classic up. You know what I'm saying? So for you, Vay, when you first heard about, you know, you being from up there, I know you got stories about that and your family and things of that nature, but when you saw the record report for Illmatic, had you heard all of Illmatic yet? Nah. I have I heard I heard what everybody else heard. Um I heard, you know, obviously the uh like halftime because like you um mentioned, you know, that came out a while ago. That came out in like ninety two. Yep. Um and um you know, I had heard it ain't hard to tell, mm-hmm. but I think I was still a little shell shocked, right, from the whole situation. Um because I remember, you know, I was a big Gangstar fan. So Gangstar is on the cover. I'm already hyped off of that. Right. I got a new album coming out. Daily Operation was my favorite. Hard to Earn is coming up. It's the follow-up. So I'm already yep. hyped off of that. Um, but I I will say the, the anticipation in me was starting to bubble bubble because of, like you said, the, the Source magazine was already priming you before they had their review um, for Nas' album. And um, a lot of artists were name dropping them. A couple of artists were name dropping them on their albums, like a Tribe Called Quest. Um, and I remember Gangstar talking about it, Premier talking about it before the album even dropped. So it was like this ground swell that was happening. And like you said, the Source magazine was the source for hip hop heads, wherever you were. Um, it was like, it was already dope that Ice Cube was like a you know a, a soloist debut that got five mics in mm-hmm. the source, but we knew Ice Cube from any way. Nas ain't really have that cachet coming in, so we didn't know what to expect. And like you said, it felt like the the source was really priming us hip hop heads up to for something big. Yeah, because I want to say he had gotten you know. Um... What 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 a quotables or something like that maybe for live in the barbecue he might have got a quotable for that I'm not a hundred percent sure but I think he got a quotable yeah. maybe at some point and then uh, just like you said on Midnight Marauders Fife Dog said something about nasty knives on, on on a track and then Lost Professor uh you know says basically knives is coming mm-hmm. in so many words on the track he did with Tribe on the Midnight Marauders so you, so yeah you had already heard of, you know heard him on some previous joints so you really couldn't wait to uh. To, to hear it. So then when the record report came out, and I'm just gonna say this one sentence real quick. The uh the the reviewer said, since we talked about Snoop Dogg just now, the reviewer said while the media was hyping Snoop Dogg's album as the most anticipated debut of all time, many of us in hip hop had our eyes on another prize, which is ill Mac. Now saying many of us had our eyes on the prize, uh one could look at that as, as New York East Coast buys to a degree. Because I don't know how many people in the South, you know, hip hop heads, maybe such as myself, but how many people in the South, in the Midwest, especially on the West Coast, were anticipating Nas Illmatic on that same kind of level almost as Snoop Dogg? I mean, most people will tell you that's just not that's not a reality. I know mm-hmm. historical people got you know historical amnesia, and you know we debated all this stuff on Twitter. Sometimes we say you have to be there. We're not trying to be funny. We're not trying to downplay someone who's younger than us or nothing like that. But there is a certain context in living through a moment in music. Like I always tell people, I have older uncles and my dad now. They tell me about, uh, even though Marvin gave my favorite singer, what's going on came out a year before I was born. So, mm-hmm. or, or what happened. So, they got to tell me about most how I felt when Smokey Robinson dropped a certain song or, you know, something like that because I didn't live through it. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So even though I respected and studied it, 
I'm going to listen to the people who live through it to a degree as well. So we were there, and we know that there was a small group of people. I mean, core New Yorkers was waiting for Nas. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Certain hip-hop heads in the South might have been. But Snoop was the biggest thing in music. So for that writer to say that, there was some bias, but it was also hyping the Nas Mystique up before you even heard the album. So this shit got five mics. This mm. guy quick to rap. We heard halftime. We heard he went to hell for snuffing Jesus. We're like, nobody, this, you know, nobody was rapping like that. So we knew it was something special about him. But reading that report, you were already in your mind thinking, this is probably, they're basically saying this is a hip hop perfection. Uh, mm-hmm. There's nothing to add to this album when you look at the review. Uh, it's a class, it's a certified hip hop classic out, out the gate before it even officially hit the record stands, even though there were bootleg versions of Illmatic out. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it was incomplete songs. There was another version that ain't hard to tell. There was another version of, uh, I want to say, it might have been one time for your mind, but it was, it was other versions of, of the album. Mm-hmm. Uh, and things of that nature. So you can YouTube uh, Illmatic uh, tracks and stuff like that. You can hear some of the uh, stuff before the album got mastered and, and released. But nevertheless, we all were like, okay, this is the next. They already started calling him the next Rock Him in the record review. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So we're talking about 1994. This young guy who was 20 years old, who we know when, when Zebrahead came out, he was 17, 18. So he's already writing classic rhymes as a teenager. Mm-hmm. And the record report, the source magazine, and everyone, you know, in New York was already starting to call him Rock Kim when most people know that Rock Kim was probably the face of the golden era of, of hip hop. You know, mm-hmm. I wrote an article on the dome, uh Rock Kim's the Miles Davis of hip hop, because up to that point when he dropped, rap was Delivered a certain way, rhymes were delivered a certain way. Him and G Rap kind of changed the way people started rapping. And Nas is kind of a combination of Rock Him and G Rap, yep. you know, what I'm saying, to a degree, especially at that time. So the anticipation was crazy. The record review made it like that. But the thing we're going to talk about too, uh, Vegas, what if Illmatic didn't receive five mics? So listen, listeners, we're going to, I know we're going to take this to Twitter at some point. I think it's the Facebook at some point, but what if Illmatic did not get five mics? What if he, even if he got four and a half mics, the mystique mm. is totally different. It's not considered perfect anymore. Yeah. So well, not me, rest on that. Well, let me um speak real quick to to what you said about um uh the the Snoop the Snoop part and um and that uh review. I I totally agree. Um that dude was kind of speaking probably for him and a certain set of fans. He definitely wasn't speaking for all of New York because when Snoop said, y'all don't love us, that shit was true. Snoop was huge in New York. Death Row was huge in New York. You know what I'm saying? Like the anticipation was Snoop and Nas, but Nas anticipation honestly was for the underground cats. Right, because he was more traditional New York rap, um, but Snoop was huge. Like uh, everybody was anticipating Snoop, and for those, you know, like you said, for those who don't believe it or forgot it, I mean, look at the record sales at the time. It the the proof is in the pudding, right? Illmatic is considered like this big, you know, like the the, the Bible of hip hop. But doggy style outsold it tremendously. So let me let me let me say this real quick. Doggy style sold went gold in the first week. Mm-hmm. You can understand it almost went, it almost went platinum the first week when it came out. Illmatic sold sixty three thousand copies the first week. It went gold after like seven eight months. It went platinum in December two thousand one. Yeah. After after Steelmatic dropped. After, 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 after Jay Z battle, that's when Ill- Illmatic hit over a million copies. Snoop did a million by the second week. So let's keep exactly. that perspective. So let's move that part out of the way. I hope people are listening on Twitter <laughs> just respect this is reality. This ain't about us debating. These are facts. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, and look, these, these are- and look, you got I guess I guess for people 
for for those who want to play devil's advocate, right, and say stuff like, you know, well, sales don't matter. But it did, right? Because if you're going to debate anticipation, the anticipation for Snoop's album is the proof is in the sales, right? People couldn't wait. That many people couldn't wait to get it. And then when they heard it was good, they got it. Whereas with Illmatic, again, it was it was a niche product. You know what I'm saying? But it was it was still huge, but it wasn't huge to the point of a Snoop to be comparable. You know um, what? You know what Illmatic is? You know, and I don't think nobody ever really placed it like this. Maybe they did, and I, I didn't see it. Illmatic is, is basically the most famous underground rap album in, in history. Because Illmatic is an underground boom bap rap album. You know what I'm saying? So that's why when Nas dropped, it was written in 1996, a lot of hip-hop, boom, back, hit underground heads were upset because they wanted an Illmatic part two. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And if, if Nas did another Illmatic, what people don't understand is he turns into J. Rude Damager, Buckshot Shorty, and all of these guys, OC and all these. This is, that's mm-hmm. Nas. You know what I'm saying? Nas is a, is a, was an underground rapper. You know what I'm saying? Halftime was a boom bap underground underground beat by Lars Professor. All, there is no commercial songs on Illmatic. You know what I'm saying? The, the singles, The World Is Yours by Pete Rock. You know, we talking about It Ain't Hard to Tell by the Lost Professor. You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. so bitch by LES, the last single dropped two years after uh, halftime dropped. So these Illmatic has no commercial songs. There's no guest appearances. Uh, on the R&B tip, AZ, the only damn guest appearance. There is no kind of drunk that you can play in the club on Illmatic. Illmatic's an underground rap album that some reviewers in New York fell in love with this. He was the golden child in terms of he had the look, mm-hmm. he had the, the voice, he had the style with the, the Kims and the, the outfit. All he had, to, he was New York pretty boy personified. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? But still a street dude with a chip roof and all that. You know, the, the fellas thought he was cool, dude. The chicks liked him. So he was a perfect storm for the underground, giving them five mics, turn Illmatic into something legendary. Don't get me wrong. It's a great album. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But it's an underground album that with no five mics, we're not talking about it today like that. You yeah, know what so I'm let's, this, yeah. yeah, so let's so let's do this. What do you what do you think? Uh be like because before we get into what if, we can save that for last, because that's the good shit. Uh but what do you think it is about Illmatic, where as a, a, a artist like Snoop, a album like Doggy Style, which is basically the rival at that point in time, could come out and stomp it in popularity and record sales, but Illmatic is so cherished, and and it could be because a lot of MCs really dug in, a lot of producers really bigged it up also. But what do you think is what what is it about Illmatic that make people say that's the, that's the holy grail compared to it takes a nation of millions to hold us back low end theory straight out of Compton like what makes it more special than other classics? I think I think the writer I think the five mics with him being his age you know what I'm saying so he really was he he called him to the golden child once or twice on on Illmatic I just think that. It's like when Shaquille O'Neal left LSU and, and, and he got to the NBA, during that time, only a couple of times in history, had a rookie made the All-Star team. You know what I'm saying? They mm-hmm. And the fans wanted him on the All-Star team, and he was on the All-Star team. Nas was the people's champion in New York when El Matic dropped. He was the underground legend. It's funny mm-hmm. to see his career now. I was just watching that video, 27 Summers. You know, he ain't like the Bentley. He in, you know, he in Miami with with Khaled and all these people, you look at him as this legendary guy now. But it's funny, when people think of underground hip-hop, Nas was an underground hip-hop legend. Yeah. And I think that the Source magazine pumped it to the point where he was forced to respect it as a classic. Um, you know what I'm saying? You wasn't cool if you didn't think it was a classic because it was pushed kind of down your throat a little bit. And also, to give us some give us some props and not sound like I'm shitting on Illmatic. Nas was so good lyrically that a lot of rappers paid attention to what he was saying and were like, yo, the dude is different, man. Like mm-hmm. he really is that good to the point where even when Biggie won the Lyrics of the Year Award, 95 Source Awards, he said when they nominated Nas, he, he didn't know if he was gonna he didn't think he was gonna win. Yeah. You know, you know what I'm saying? So 
Illmatic is lyrical perfection, the flow, everything. You know what I'm saying? The wordplay, everything. So I think that you had the magazine, you had other MCs starting to say, hey, you know, do the special. Then you have this group of very popular, these are the most popular New York uh, producers at the time. You're yeah. talking about when Illmatic dropped, Primo was arguably the boom bap king. Yeah, you know what I'm yeah. saying? You got these gangster albums, you know what I'm saying? You got all these other joints he was doing with Lord Finesse and uh, you know, all these other guys, you know, so 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 Primo was huge. I already know it's Pete Rock coming off, you know what I'm saying, the main ingredient and and and, 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 and all this stuff. So Pete Rock was huge, you know what I'm saying? So you got Pete Rock talking to people about the people who love Pete Rock, he talking to them about Nas, how special he is. Try called Quest they dropped the Midnight Marauders the year before that. Tribe is at the height of their career. YouTube is going around calling Nas a monk. You know what I'm saying? He called. He, he said this kid is like a monk, man. Like this is just some other shit that I haven't seen. You know what I'm saying? So now the Tribe fans are, you know, room for Nas. Lost Professor Underground. They they his his people room for Nas. You know what I'm saying? So you got all of this stuff going on, man. So I think that it was a perfect storm for the Underground. You know what I'm saying? And I think that it just became like folklore. It just spread it uh, even all I'm in North Carolina. You know what I'm saying? I'm I'm reading the source magazine. I'm like, damn, it must be that good. Then I heard, I'm like, but see, my mind, psychology wise, is in my mind that I'm, I'm about to listen to a class. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I'm glad you said that, because that's that's exactly where I was going. I was I was wondering, because I, I agree with everything you said. Like, um, for all those reasons, you know what I'm saying, it it just it was it was different it was something really different that felt big you know what i'm saying even when you listen to it and and knowing the pedigree of these producers they coming off of making classic albums and again they're working with a cat who didn't have prior work like snoop had uh let me, yeah, what's up? Yeah. Let me say this too uh pardon me think about this we, we do know and i hate to bring this up but it's just this, this, this is true so Illmatic, the anticipation for Nas. So this is 1994. From 1990 to 1994, because Illmatic April 94, the West Coast was kind of kicking our ass, okay? So we're talking about at one point, after NWA disbanded or what have you, or stopped making music, Ice Cube drops America's Most Wanted and the death certificate back to back. Dr. Mm -hmm. Dre, Dr. Dre drops the chronic. DJ Quickie at the end of the mix drops his joints. You know what I'm saying? Um, you have where Dr. Dre, you know, the chronic, like you said, comes in, Dr. Tal comes, you know what I'm saying? They're on top of the world. You know what I'm saying? So you got mm -hmm. several years of kind of West Coast dominance. Yeah, you still got Tribe doing well. You know, you, you got some East Coast guys, Carrie Rest in the field doing well. But on the grand scale of hip hop, the West Coast is running rap at that time. Yep, you know yep. what I'm saying? So we needed something for, you know, Wu Tang had dropped, 36 Chambers mm -hmm. in 93, so that was huge. And they dropped the same day, if I'm not mistaken, as the Midnight Marauder. So there was some momentum coming back because Wu Tang was so unique. But we still needed a one person, you know what I'm saying, representative as well. Because Wu Tang was a clan. Mm -hmm. Who was going to be our front runner to rival Snoop? Because yeah. Snoop is running hip hop. People, listen to what I'm saying to you. Doggy Style came out at the end of 93, like October, November. So, going into 94, Snoop Dogg is the largest rapper in the world, okay? East Coast, West Coast, Down South, Europe, everywhere, it's all about Snoop. Mm -hmm. The East Coast needed a representative. The five-minute review gave us Nas. Until mm -hmm. Biggie dropped, Ready to Die, and Puffy did what he did with the remixing of, you know, One More Chance and having Juicy and stuff like that, because again, mm -hmm. Biggie is an underground rapper. You take the commercial joints off and big man it dies a bunch of machine gun funks and damn warning. <laughs> exactly. So, Today for Puff, man it dies illmatic. All over. Exactly. Again. Exactly. I'll say and, that again. Look, I'm glad you I'm glad you said I'm glad you brought that up because um again, it's it's the truth, right? Snoop was the new generation of, of West Coast hip hop, right? And he was hot. He was crazy hot. And so was the whole death row. Listen, to, when we heard "Stranded on Death Row," we was like, "Holy shit!" Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, they had, and it wasn't just West Coast bars. They had people like Corrupt, Rage. They had everything. 
in that one camp. Um, the DOC so I agree. Camp, the DOC is in that camp helping them create exactly. like Snoop said, the DOC assisted Snoop in learning how to actually write bars because Snoop used to just freestyle. So Snoop would rap exactly. like 10 minutes. He would rap like 10 minutes. So the DOC taught him how to break down song structures, same way he did with Dre and other people. The DOC is from Dallas, Texas. But the DOC had got to an accident. We know the story about no one can do a better legendary album. He was great. He was probably going to end up being maybe a top 10 all time, but he got he lost his voice. But he was still mm. right helping all of the artists on Death Row construct songs and stuff. So Death Row had a monster machine behind yeah. it. And like you said, it it took it took several East Coast artists. I always say this, right, on my podcast. I always say that I was so heavy into that part of West Coast hip hop because it was gritty, it was street, and it was real. And not that I dislike the East Coast, like the leaders of the new school and Daylight and Tribe, but I had got tired of the, the fun wordplay guys, you know what I'm saying, with the colorful videos and the cross colors. And right. I kind of wanted that grittiness that the West Coast was given. So when we got Wu-Tang and Nas and Black Moon and Mob Deep, and Biggie, then it was kind of like, now we had that. And yep. like you said, Illmatic was kind of like the tent pole of all those releases because it was this one dude with one feature from another unknown cat. Nobody knew who it was. was. Yeah, and it was unbelievably dope. So I, let me ask you this. Uh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say what I thought first, but then you can follow up. With all that hype leading up, considering the album wasn't out, but the review was out, they had already did a whole article on Nas. He already had Rhyme of the Month probably twice, if I remember correctly, because I think he also had one for Life's a Bitch. Um, he had all this buildup. We all dumbing through the source. We like, goddamn, Illmatic, right? When we finally got it, obviously, like you said, psychology of all of this shit already told you is great. You know, I know for me personally, listening to it, being close to the situation, it was a different lesson for me, right? Because I knew Nas. I grew up with him practically, you know what I'm saying? Because I was from Brooklyn. They was from Queensbridge. But my family's from Queensbridge. If y'all don't know, my cousin is ill. Well, yes, all of it ties together. But I used to be there a lot. So there was this thing with me for one is trying to listen to this person that I know rap. And I'm a big rap fan, but how do I separate knowing him versus the rapper? And it was it was extremely difficult, right? right? Because everything, even though I listened to every word, I was missing a lot of the skill. You know what I'm saying? Because I couldn't step away from him being nice. But when I was able to, I don't think, I think the source played a little bit of a role in how I uh, digested the album, right? Because they kind of told me what was there, right? Like what he's doing, that's great. And then I could kind of hear it. And then I could hear it in parts that they didn't highlight. Like on songs like Represent, like the Son of Sam bars. Like when I heard that shit, I was like, God damn, yeah, the Nasi is dope. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so for me, it, it was like a slow burn and to love an album and feeling comfortable calling it a hip hop classic. But for you, given everything that just like a hip hop fan, but just in a different location, everything you saw or heard leading up to the album, when you listened to it, did you did you really feel like, yo, maybe I just like this shit because the source told me it's dope? Or was it really hitting you like, damn, this this is great? So few things. One, marketing is important. You know, marketing, you know, any kind of product, if it's done right, it will give you some kind of impression, you know. You know, you know. So, if, for example, if, I'll be real brief with this. Uh, there was a CBS, I think, special came out like in the 90s called Century of Self. And it was about psychology behind marketing. And uh, um, the guy named was Edward Bernays, and I think he was Sigma Freud's nephew. He was hired by all these big companies to do marketing. Like, for example... Back then, he would have the the big oversized hamburger with the with the woman with the beautiful lips about to bite the burger or, or drink the milkshake, and it was impressionable. And they'll make people want to mm -hmm. eat the McDonald's or eat the burger or whatever. So anytime you see something, you see the articles, you see the spreads, the layouts, it, it, 
it gives a bump to whatever you're about to uh, engulf. So, yeah, mm -hmm. going into it, I was like, okay, I expect it to be a classic. You know what I'm saying? But I'm also a realist, and I've been the same with my whole life. If I don't like them, I'll be like, yeah, hey, I don't care what they wrote down. The chicken wasn't good. You know what I'm saying? So I'm one of those people. I'll say the chicken got too many mics, we ain't get enough. You know what I'm saying? So when I heard it, you know, I remember getting it, and I heard the Genesis, and then New York State of Mind came on. And I was like, okay, so all right, so this is a picture of New York. Dude is nice. I like his voice, too. Okay, he can rap. He's, he's nice. Mm -hmm. And I got the rest of this track three. This track three, I'm like, is he nice too? And okay, nah, nah. His his verse was right there. I mean, dude is nice. I got to the world is yours. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh my goodness. <laughs> I said, it's like the light go off. I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. this, this is what they talking about. This shit mm -hmm. right here. When I got to that last verse of the world is yours, I was like, all right, so he's special. Now this this I, okay. I wasn't ready for that. I get to the next song, halftime, I get then memory lane. I dropped the ancient manifest the hip hop straight off the block. I said, he got it. <laughs> I that's what when memory lane came on, I said, this is the best rapper I've heard in a long in a couple of years. And that's including yeah. the Snoop, Ice Cube, all of them. I said, this is the best rap I done heard since. The carrots one and I came I came and I'm not, ain't nobody rapping like this. You know what I'm saying? I heard party and bullshit with Biggie, you know what I'm saying? So like that. I heard juicy and all that, whatever. But I was like, ain't nobody rapping like this. You know what I'm saying? So once I by the time I got it ain't hard to tell and the beat start going out and the and the album went off, I like, yep. I was like, yeah, that's this is this is this is this this dude is is next up. I don't know how much he's going to sell. I don't know how famous he's going to be. That's why I was so glad when it was written. I love it was written. You know what I'm saying? Because he got what he deserved. 2.5 million sold. But yeah, yeah, man. When I, when I got to the end of that album, when I specifically got to uh, The World Is Yours and then Memory Lane, I I throw my hands up, bro. That was it. <laughs> I don't even care what the review said at that point because they was right at that point to me. I'm like, okay, they, they was right. I thought it was my hyperbole, but you know what? I hear what they heard. Yeah. I Yeah, and I, I think I eventually got there, too, after a while. Because I think in the very beginning, um, like, people got to understand, like like Tone said, Halftime came out in 1992, right? Um, what was it, the fall? October or something? October. Like that? Yep. October. Uh, my cousin, Ill Will, was killed in May of 1992. Mm. Shit was it was just too raw to even hear hear ill will rest in peace was just too raw in me. He said it on halftime. Yeah, he said it on halftime. My little cousin's in a video. Uh I think it just played. Um, but yeah, my little cousin's in the video. He the one with the chain on, he wearing, you know, will chain and, and and posing in front of the camera. Um, it was just too raw for me. And around that time, um, that was the time where Nas was still kind of into projects like that. So when he did the video for um, uh, Halftime, they would do this thing at my my, um, my aunt's house where, she, you know, she would fry chicken or whatever, cook some food, and he would bring his new video by. And um, a couple of times I came through, like for Halftime and for uh, Back to the Grill Again when he was in that video. Um, by the time, like, it was written, happened, I hadn't been there in a while. Um, but I was, I was on the set for The World Is Yours. It's just that you got to understand, I am a very impatient person. <laughs> Videos take a long ass time. And after a while, I was like, I'm out. I'm, I'm going upstairs. So trust me, there's a lot of hip hop videos I was on the set, but I ain't in the <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Because after a while, I'm like, God damn, he going to say that same line again? I'm out. Um, but yeah, man, it, it was like for me, it was all of that, and it being so close to to when he died, and and you know, you listening to the radio when you spent your youth with your cousin, listening to the radio, listening to the bridges over, listening to dope hip hop records come out, and talking about what you heard the other night, and now you listening to a record, and it's his friend that you know on the radio saying rest in peace. To your cousin, yeah. that was a hell of a mountain for me to climb. That's tough. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, the hip hop fan in me after a while, you know, once I was done mourning, then I could see it. Then I was like, okay, now I see what everybody's talking about. This shit is special. This this ain't no this ain't no drive by joint. But let's get into the part that the, the fun part, right? The part is gonna make the Twitter trolls upset because they like lying on Twitter and all that shit. What if Elmatic didn't get five mics? Tone, what do you think the outcome would have been with this album? Well, a lot of things would have happened uh, for personally, because you got to think, even with the five mics and the hype around it, it still was a flop. It was a commercial flop, people. I mean, mm -hmm. I know it's a sexy thing to say, and some of y'all probably think you will matter so too many records in the first week. You know what I'm saying? Because that's what, that's what Twitter tell you. The reality is, even with the hype and the five mics, this shit sold 63,000 copies the first week. It wasn't go for almost a damn year. It wasn't platinum for damn six, seven years. So mm -hmm. let's just go and get it out of the way. Without five mics, again, Illmatic is entered the stage, people. Okay? That's the example I'll give you. If it doesn't get five mics and it gets four and a half mics like, like Black Moon entered the stage, it's entered the stage. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. People going to say this this young guy, can, he can rap. It's dope. You know what I'm saying? The other dude, AZ, can rap too, but it's a, it's, a, it's a dope album. It's a dope New York East Coast album. Like mm -hmm. Hard to Earn, like The Infamous, like a lot of those albums. That's what they are. You know what I'm saying? And that's what, you know, that's what uh, it'll matter would have been. It would have been a dope ass underground album. Uh, if it sold 63,000 the first week as a five minute album, anything less than that, that shit might have sold like fucking Big L out debut album. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it's and big because big can rap like miles at the time, people. So it's, it's it's that it's lifestyles of the poor and dangerous. You know what I'm saying? It's, mm -hmm. it's those kind of albums. So Nas' entire career is different without five yeah. mic. Maybe he don't, does. What does he do for it was written? Is it even called it was written? Does he does he get with track masters? Does he do? Does Steve Stout even want to deal with him? If it ain't the, the Nas or the Five Mike Nas, does he have any direction? Mm -hmm. His whole career, but Illmatic, basically, it, it it could potentially turn into an album you heard and loved before a year or two, and it, it and it's with the other underground albums you pull out every now and then when you want to hear some hard boom bap hip hop. That's what it yeah. turns into. The whole trajectory of the album layout and his whole career is is totally different. Five Mike from the source. I I can't disagree, man. I, I think I think you hit the nail on the head. I think I think it becomes, like you say, into the stage. It becomes the shining, right? These albums that we call a classic kind of felt like the source. Sunrise and five mics. Sunrise and Ace. Like, you know, albums that the source probably got wrong, you know what I'm saying, as far as not giving five mics, but they become underground classics, right? Like the hype is just as much as a part of the mystique of Illmatic as the actual album. Because what some people fail to recognize is the criticisms from back then, right? Like, I love Empire Strikes Back from Star Wars. It's my favorite Star Wars movie. It's Amazing. kind of the Illmatic out of the Star Wars movies. But when it dropped, it wasn't reviewed as such. Illmatic kind of was. And the thing is, is with Illmatic, I think it's, um, I think, uh, again, the five mics, the, the, the cachet of the, of the source, you know what I'm saying? At the time, like if they gave it five mics, it gotta be great. Um, the, the producers that were on it, all of these different things, the, the product that came out, but there were critiques that weren't favorable. Like it's too short, right? A lot of people said that shit. A lot of people said it's too short, right? They Absolutely. felt like maybe he, maybe that's all he had. Like, that's why the album was short because really that was his best work. How could he top that up? Obviously, he got better on It Was Written and showed that. Um, but like Tone said, okay, does he go into It Was Written with some serious momentum without having the, the balancing scale of, it's it's ranked up here, the highest of the highest, 
but the sales say not that many people really care. You and you know, what know what too? And also, mm -hmm. and also, not only did people say it was too short during that time when we was living in when it came out, some people said, Damn, what you gonna play on the song's gonna be on the radio? And which one will get the rotation? Other cats was like, Okay, it just sounds good on the corner on the block, but what's gonna play in the fucking club, dog? How the chicks gonna how the, how the chicks gonna receive it? Even recently, Big Daddy came to the interview. He was like, "Yeah, he talked to Nas back when he finished Illmatic." He said, "Don't get me wrong, Illmatic was a classic." He said, "But it's fun." I told I told Nas, and I was like, "Yo, if it was anything I could change about it, I make at least one track for the for the latest, my dude." You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, it's on, it's on YouTube. The King just did an interview not too long ago, and he said, "Yeah." Mm -hmm. Thing would have been I'd have made a, 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 a song for the chicks. He said, Of course, I would have done that. He said, But yeah, Matic is a classic, you know, lyrics, mm -hmm. everything was all, all there, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, it was several critiques at the time with Nas with, with uh, Illmatic, and a lot of people when they knew he was gonna do a follow up, you got some boom bap heads, one another Illmatic, but a lot of people was like, Yeah, Nas gotta do something different, you know what I'm saying? Like, he did his back back shit, he gotta make a, a bigger, a big album because right now. Fucking Biggie ready to die is four million damn near, and Junior Mafia and all this shit like that. And so it's like you gotta put people Biggie now. You know what and I'm saying? And I'm glad you said that because yeah. that like we could take Snoop out of it. Like we was comparing it to Snoop, but his counterparts were commercially successful compared to him. But yet Illmatic, even back then, was like the bigger album, which is crazy. Uh when you think about it. What well, let yeah. me ask you this. Do you think the remixes was an attempt to to give him radio singles, right? It ain't hard to tell. It ain't hard to tell was kind of his radio single. Then they had a remix. The world no, was hey, remix. You know I, when I think of remixes that was aimed specifically for the clubs and for the radio, to a puff did because puff he 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 gangstered that shit into mm -hmm. into ready to die. Did the one more chance remix. You know, said all the shit like that. That was a rap. You know what I'm saying? Whatever. But for Nas, his remixes could have been like bonus tracks on Ill Matter. It was a hard street remixes. And, you know, Q-Tip did the damn World of Shores uh, remix, and it was hard. It was just as hard as the first one. You know what I'm saying? As far as mm -hmm. underground style, you know, and they did a, they did another, I think they did another, another version, it ain't hard to tell. They had the remix of uh, a couple of joints, I think, at some point on there, but they weren't really commercial attempts. They just, it's time, it was boom out. Underground on the block songs, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So that's kind of what it was with, with Nas. The, the, I don't think it was no kind of attempt really to, it was organic. And I think uh, one of the reasons why Illmatic now is looked at the way it's looked at, not just because of the record report, but you listen to it now, it is the, one of the more organic, straight New York essence of the birth of hip hop. You got the Genesis mm -hmm. with the shit, Wild Style. Go right into New York State of Mind. All of it ain't hard to tell. I listened to it twice this week, commuting uh, to, to our corporate office all the way through. And both times I, I was still catching little rhymes that I forgot he damn said. You know what I'm saying? It was a very clever, I mean, it was lyrically amazing. And I get, I get the mystique of it, you know what I'm saying? Because it was a perfect little storm. But without that rank, uh, without the ratings, I still think kids will be discovered until this day. Like, damn, look what I found. You know what yeah. I'm saying? I found this shit, this Nas, Nas dude. Because I think his curriculum, again, no fire mics. Who follows up and work with him? Like, again, the Steve Stout track masters and all these guys still want to work with him because, again, Q Tip and Lost the First Autumn could have all did Illmatic Part 2. And yeah, the, the boom back there would have loved it. But it's a motherfucker that popped in mind and never heard it. It heard Street Dreams. Mm -hmm. If I rule the world with Lauryn Hill, though. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, again, he turns into you know, all of those New York guys. Biggie would have been the same way. You take all the yep. singles yep. off, you take Puff out, Red or Die is, again, it's Warren and Machine Gun Funk. It's an underground yep. album like Sun Rise in the East. So, yeah. people don't understand the, how big the source was for crowning, you know, this crown jewel. Uh, of Illmatic, man. It just changed the trajectory. And it changed the way a lot of people looked at the Source magazine. It changed the way people looked at F5 Mics. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it didn't just make 
Now it's bigger with Illmatic or Illmatic to the forefront. It made the source seem more important. It made the source seem like we really care about authentic hip hop. You know what I'm saying? We gave this guy Nas, this 18, 19 year old guy, he just turned 25 mics for just rapping his ass off for nine songs. Because yeah, Illmatic got nine songs, them EP, really. Yeah. To a degree, well, you know, so there was the 80s album sometimes had 10 songs on it, but nevertheless, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of albums that came out at the same time, Nas came out, you know, right after that, Red or Die, Cuba Links, all these albums, they had like 16, 17 songs. Yeah. And when you think about it, around in, in the 90s, um, five mics or the mics in general in the source were like bigger than they was from the albums that were in the 80s. Some albums that already had five mics. They The mics meant more in the 90s because I think the, the new generation on the East Coast and West Coast and counting outcasts and all of that, it's down south and all of that, there was really a lot more attention being paid to to lyrics, to to this discovery, like, you know, these new cats. Um, some of these magazines from the past that you might go look at, you know, you might see in the demo madness section, you might see Eminem there. You know what I'm yep. saying? Like it was really like a gold mine for the future in the in the, the current state of hip hop. And um Nas probably had one of the best promotional Promotion. campaigns for a debut album ever. Uh you know what I'm saying? Because it he, he, he couldn't do no wrong. You know what I'm saying? After you know what you said. Like you said, the five mics for, for Nas was just looked at different because, you know, yeah, Ice Cube got five mics for 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 for, for his one of his albums. Then you had uh, Tribe got five mics for them. People's Instinct of Travels, you know what I'm saying? And like ninety nine one, and then De La Soul got five mics for De La Soul is dead. That ain't even that's not even the best De La Soul album. You know what I'm yeah. saying? De La Soul is dead got five mics. I think the brand new is one for all got five mics. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So there are people getting five mics. And, you know, and then you turn around and get a chronic fucking uh, uh, four and a half mics, and you gave Doctor have four mics. You know what I'm saying? But so you know, and then you gave gave Nas uh, five mics for Illmatic, and it turned into something totally different. Um, and I think that's when people really pushed, because I think Wu Tang got four and a half mics for Thirty Six Chambers. You know what I'm yeah, saying? So yeah, so yeah, the fact he got five mics after all the other great albums over the previous like three years didn't get it. Or they got it like De La Soul is dead, and only the native tongue type fans appreciated that five mics from De La Soul because mm -hmm. you ask a lot of West Coast guys right now, our age, and down south guys in the deep south, our age, the De La Soul got a five mic album. They're like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Nas get five yeah. mic. Oh yeah, dude, Nas got five for the Illmatic. You know what I'm saying or whatever, mm -hmm. but. De La Soul, we don't even know what's the name of the album. De La Soul is dead. Yeah, that she got five mics. You know what I'm saying? Try first album. People just think the travels niggas in California want to listen to that shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it was different it's, when it's I was there. Yeah, it, it was. It was. It was interesting. It was. I think the to to cap it off. I think um, it was just the timing. It was like the it was the perfect storm. The perfect time, like you said, from what the West Coast was doing to what was emerging from the East Coast, and it was different. It was somewhat familiar, like you said, with the Rakim and Kooji Rap comparisons, and it was just a lot of energy behind it, especially coming from the East Coast with all these East Coast producers who were hot at the time. Um, it was just was a perfect storm, and Nas was like the perfect MC to 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 help, you know, this. East Coast resurgence that happened in the, uh, yep. the mid '90s. So, um, dope show. But to you, the listener, what or the viewer, what did you think if you were around? What did you think about Illmatic when you read about it in the Source mm -hmm. magazine? And what did you think about it when you actually got the time to hear it? Do you feel like the Source magazine? In some ways, told you it was a classic, so you you enjoyed every tidbit of it, or did you see flaws in it? Um, and do you see flaws in it today? Does it deserve the holy grail thing that it gets on Twitter to the point where even Nas is sick of the conversation? 
leave your comments uh, leave your comments in the section below we'll respond to that uh but here's the thing we like to end off with on the show we uh like to recommend a, a album or two you should go back and listen to and for me it's the debut album from freeway philadelphia freeway out of the year 2003 man when this album came out i gotta be honest i like freeway his his features on jay-z and rockefeller products but i was like can i listen to a whole album of that voice i didn't know if i could but then the debut album had a lot i think it's a feature on every damn song to be honest and I figured, okay, well, maybe they thinking the same thing because there's a feature on every uh, song. But I don't think there's a whack song on his album at all. <laughs> the album is crazy. I mean, the features go from, obviously, Jay-Z and all that, but Nate Dogg's on here, Petey Crack, Nelly, Snoop Dogg, Faith, Beanie Siegel, of course, uh, Rel from Rockefeller, uh, uh, Alan Anthony, also from Rockefeller. Um, Young Chris from the Young Gunners. It's about 16 tracks, an hour and 11 minutes. Literally, there's, there's literally one, two songs without a feature. But the songs are so dope that it didn't even matter, man. Tone, when this album dropped in 2003, were you anticipating it? And what did you think when you got the chance to hear it? You know what? Uh... I like Freeway on uh, the Dynasty album and a couple of joints with Jay and all. I said, you know what, you know, dude got energy, man. And, you know, he, he got some energy. I, I kind of, I kind of dig his style a little bit. I didn't love his voice, but it was okay. I wasn't really that mad at it, man. Mm -hmm. I, I like the way he attacked the, the tracks. It, it, like he was really into his craft. I'm like, so mm -hmm. he got a debut album coming out. I remember hearing "What We Do" on the singles. You know, what I'm saying "What We Do." I said, that's a dope ass song. You know what I'm saying? But I'm not going to lie. I didn't expect what happened. Happened. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like when, I, when, that, when I got that album, because I got on the strength of that what we do and just support the rock and feel. I like the movement at the time and stuff like that. And I'm, when I tell you pleasantly, pleasantly surprised, I got like halfway through that album. I was like, damn, this shit is great. You know? <laughs> I swear to God, man, I got halfway through it. I'm like, damn, this freeway album. The production is banking. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Song yeah. structure, books. I mean, I think the Nelly song might be the only song the album I don't really love. You know what I'm saying? Like the album is stellar, man. Like I'm, a, I'm gonna be honest with you. The, he had club joints on there, hood joints on there, radio joints on there. Man, I can't feel enough in freeway four and a half mics, bro. I yeah, think it's man. that. I think it's that good. Yeah, I, and look, I think it's an album that aged pretty well. Because when so, I came back to it, I was just, you know how you haven't heard an uh, album in a while, and and you start and when you listen to old school mixes, you know certain songs get airplay. There were certain songs I was like, damn, this was on Freeway album. Like, damn, this was on Freeway album. I mean, you're right, man. It's it was just it was kind of unbelievable well, well, even well. coming back to it. Yeah, that's, coming back that's dope. To it was unbelievable to me. Uh, but yeah, man. So, what's what's your recommendation for the people? Yeah, man. Uh, first off, man, R.I.P. Man, M.F. Doe, man. Um, my, my my pick this week is his debut album. Of course, he had a lot of albums and he had his joints with K.M.D. the Mr. Hood and all that, like '91, man. But his official debut under M.F. Doom was Operation Doom Day in 1999, man, and you know, I had heard the tracks by him, man, and I thought he was real creative, man. And he had the little cartoon superhero shit thing going. And I was like, dude, this is interesting, man. Let me check out this joint. And when I put the operation, so I didn't hear it when it first dropped. I probably heard a year or two after that. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, oh, what's up on this? I, I, somehow I missed it, but the production was dope. I like mm -hmm. his sampling and stuff like that. Like, you know, the beats was dope. He got an ill, crazy, he had an ill, man. Oh, man, he's, he passed away, man. I hate to say had, man, but, you know, he, mm -hmm. he just had a very ill flow and wordplay. He definitely was one of the most unique MCs 
ever in hip hop history. There is only one MF Doom. Um, and most definitely a lot of other rappers, you know what I'm saying, loved MF Doom. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it's crazy. I remember um, one of my homies, man, uh, night he was like, yo, I like to work with Doom too, man. Doom is dope. I mean, a lot of people really dug him. You know what I'm saying? And Operation Doom Day, you know what I'm saying? Like all all the samples and the beats, man. He had this song, my song I'm gonna call it the MIC. You know what I'm saying? He had a song, my favorite MF Doom song, baby, is the MIC. And I like the hook. You know, I, I you know, I know I know that people love the uh, Mad Villain uh joint, whatever. It came in 2004, a few years later. A lot of people call it a legendary underground classic and all that. He has several very good albums, but Man, I, I I tend to go back to Operation Doomsday as my favorite MF Doom album, man. So yeah, man, just rest in peace to him. Dope album, man. If you never heard that, people, you know, go on YouTube and skim that uh, Operation Doomsday, man. Let me let me know what you think about it, man. Well, did you ever hear Operation Doomsday, man? Yeah, man, I, I own it. Um, okay. Uh, but originally, I I wasn't I wasn't on it like that. Like in '99, I was hosting Strictly Hip Hop in Baltimore. Uh, shout out to them, and I, and you know, it's my first radio show ever. I'm a big hip hop fan to begin with, and um, you know, I'm trying to figure out what what my style is as a host, as um, as a curator of the music versus Kill. Shout out to Kill, who was the host before me, and um, I just remember, like, you know, there were just certain under the underground dudes. That was coming at me like yo why you ain't playing this one why you ain't playing this one and i would listen to it and i'm like man this shit weird like nobody yeah. nobody who listens to this show want to hear that shit right um and and then for me it was kind of a personal thing too because i was a big kmd fan so yeah. liking zev love x a lot and then having them turn into mf doom i was like i, I don't know if i like this uh, but I remember one time I, I just kept hearing about Operation Doomsday and how much, uh, and you know, his other albums, MF Food, uh, MF Food Joint. Um, yeah. And I just decided, I was like, all right, I'm going to listen to Operation Doomsday so I could at least see if I could hear well, what these cats are, are trying to get me to play. And I remember when I listened at first, you know, at first I'm just like, yo, this shit's so weird. Then I started to get it. Yeah, the marinade. Yeah, I was like, ah, uh, because it's the MC in me was like, oh, I see what he's doing, right? He just being creative. He just being the most lyrically wordplay. It's not that the shit don't make sense. It's just not uniform like the rest of the hip hop. It's it's meant for you to dig through and piece things yep. together. And even like you said, with the production. Right, the production in some ways mirrored that, and then I got it, and I was like, "Damn, this shit is dope!" And Mad Villainy, Born Like This, like I've I've been uh, even up to uh, MF Doom versus uh, what was it? No, nah, not MF Doom, Zarface versus Metal Face, which is more yeah. recent. Um, I was just hooked. So when I heard Operation Doomsday, man, and once I finally got it, um. Then the hip hop head in me was like, damn, like you. I was like, damn, I slept on this joint because yeah. this dude is dope for what he does. So I agree, man. Very dope album. Rest in peace to MF Doom, man. Uh a, yeah. literally a legend in hip hop. When yeah. you can be yeah. as popular as Zed Love X and KMD as they was at that time, and just change your whole style and almost become a big a bigger legend. He did become a bigger legend. You know what I'm saying? And he have the admiration of, of MCs from all walks of life. Um, for, for one, I will mention this. I know it kind of made us rounds, but you want to talk about somebody who has an influence that's not just us because we're older and we were around. Look at the video of Tyler the Creator and Earl Sweatshirt, yep. Odd Future, meeting MF Doom for the first time. It was like they met their God, right? <laughs> they couldn't they, believe they it. Know. Yeah, they knew every lyric when he was performing. It was true fans. And I think it's a testament to what that man left behind. And, and, look at, and, and real quick, too, just to uh, mm -hmm. bounce off of that, you had 
Earl and Tyler and them looking at doing like that. But then you got most definitely Ghostface killing all them, all paying homage like they they love MF Doom. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? So he had this very wide range of admirers, man. And I think that for people inside the culture, you almost had no choice because first he wasn't whack, he was dope, but he absolutely was an original. There, yeah. there would never be another MF Doom. He didn't bite shit. You know what I'm saying? He was special. And people appreciate creativity, man. And, you know, you can't get bored with creativity. Then he turned around and started making out on beats with shot in and, and Anita mm-hmm. Baker samples and stuff like that. And, oh, crazy, man. Yeah. Rest in peace, man. MF Doom, man. No doubt. Go check out those albums, Operation Doomsday by MF Doom and Philadelphia Freeway by Freeway. Two very dope albums in hip hop, and two albums that we will, at the end of 2021, uh, add to our playlist. We got playlists on Spotify and Apple uh, um, on Apple Music playlist. Hip hop, that time in hip hop playlist. Literally, all of the albums we recommended took songs off of those albums, put it in the playlist. When you put it on shuffle, if you a hip hop fan. It's the greatest shit you ever heard because me and Tone have picked a variety of albums from different times, from different types of artists. So when the tracks come on, I guarantee you if there are artists or albums you slept on, when you hear some of the songs, you'll be like, holy shit, I need to go listen to that. Because trust me, even I was listening to uh, the playlist and one of the joints that um, Tone recommended, I can't remember the name of the artist, Medium? Uh, is that yeah, medium, medium. Medium. Yeah, and he had the uh, Brenda's baby. That was his yes, song, right? Yes, absolutely. That song came on, and I I was brought back to the episode where Tone talked about, it, and I was like, "Yo, this shit is crazy." Not you. a lot of people has ever heard of it. Never heard of it. He, it, it's a and real quick. It's the song. Somebody got Brenda baby out of the trash can. Yeah, and that, that kid grew up. No, Medians, Brenda's Baby, you got to YouTube Median, man. Dope North Carolina MC, personal homie of mine, man, from, from 19th Camp back in the day with the Justice League here in North Carolina. That's my guy, cool, laid-back dude. I don't know if he's recording. It's been a minute since I talked to him, but the dude's a hella MC. Medians Relief. Mm-hmm. Check it out, man. Yeah, and if, if you want to know what you're talking about, the link is in the description on Spotify. On Apple Music, you can listen to uh, those playlists of recommendations from that time in hip-hop. That's going to do it for us. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Share this episode with people who talk about Illmatic all the time so they can get educated. Whatever you may do, definitely hit that like button because that helps us out. Leave a review if you're listening to the audio podcast. Whatever you have to do to support this show to keep it going. On uh, behalf of the homie Tony of IntoTheDome.com, I'm Vegas of Hip Hop Now Podcast. Go out and support real hip hop. Peace. Peace. Dropping on the random.